Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Fish Lake Bible Church on this snowy Sunday morning. We're glad you all made it here safely. We're glad you're here to worship together with us. I'm going to ask that you stand with us this morning as we sing our new song of the month, Holy Forever. Amen. 
Good morning. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful. You don't even need our praises. You don't need our praises to be who you are. You don't need our praises to be holy. You don't need us to tell you that you're worthy. But the beauty of it is you invite us to to remind our hearts of who you are. You don't need to be reminded. We do. So, Father, I ask that this morning we would be reminded of who you are, that we would take hope in that, that we would take rest in that. We would find peace. We would find intimacy with our Savior. And if we don't know our Savior, I pray that today would be the day. Lord, be with us this morning. Fill our hearts with joy, regardless of our circumstances. Because you are holy forever and completely in control. In your name, amen. Good morning. You may be seated. I want to play a game. My name is uh, Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. Thankful that you're here. If you're visiting with us, if you got a bulletin, should have been given one. But if you have one, uh, in that bulletin is a section you can fill out visitor information. Let us know you came. We'd love to say hi to you, uh, get in touch with you, and just say thanks for coming to Fish Lake. Uh, if you guys want to throw up that slide, we have... I want to, you know, the two birds, one stone theory. I want to do three birds, one stone within the span of about three minutes, okay? So here we go. Everybody take out your phones. Everybody take out your phones. Some of you are, <laughs> some of you are like, no. <laughs> That's okay. There is an alternative for those who are not going to use their phones. We'll get there. Um, take out your phones, pull out your camera app, and then point your camera at that code on the, on the screen. It should, it should pull up a little bubble that you can click on. Click on that bubble. That bubble should take you to our brand new website. Yay! Yay. FishLakeBibleChurch.org. It's the same address as the previous one. It works. Hopefully, if it doesn't, please let me know so I can fix that. Um, but really excited to have that new website launched. And here's a few features that I want to just highlight briefly. Because this, you'll notice, takes you directly to our Ladies Brunch page, which is on January 13th from 9 to 11. There is an option that you can RSVP for that event on that page. Just click the RSVP button, fill out the form, we'll have your information. Super easy, fast, uh, flexible for you, okay? Not every single event will be on the website. Just ones that are geared and catered towards like an outreach, maybe something that is a larger event uh, that we need like an RSVP form for, okay? Our website is geared towards visitors. Website is geared towards those who are looking to get some information about Fish Lake. But on our men's ministry page, women's, students, or children's, we will, from time to time, put events up there that we want you to know about that you can RSVP to or share to your social media uh, or the like, okay? For those of you who are like, absolutely not, not doing that, we have paper signups. We'll continue doing those. We'll communicate with you in the way that we've been communicating with you, but you can also let Beth know if you guys, ladies, if you're planning on joining that brunch, okay? So please, feel free. Explore the, uh, explore the website. Do it during the sermon. <laughs> Nothing. All right. Don't. I'm scared. Don't do that. Um, but anyways, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, why don't we stand and greet one another? Welcome to church. Go ahead and stand back up with us as you find your seats this morning. We continue in worship. Let's focus on the hope that we have in Christ, our living hope. Let's sing together. Who could imagine 
remain standing with us as we continue <clears throat> singing together firm foundation he won't
Now is the time where part of our service will ask our men to come and take up our offering. I just want to ask you this morning, the songs that we've sung, the songs that we sing, especially that one, do you truly believe it? Like, I just, I want us to stop and rest for a moment, take ourselves outside of the normal flow of what we expect church to be. Do you believe that he will not fail you? And are you living like it? So I'll be honest with you, the last two months of my personal life and my family's life it has been very easy to doubt that. I just want to be honest with you. It's been easy to doubt that he is not failing us. Easy to doubt why he's doing what he's deciding to do. But the more I come back, rain came, wind blew. If our house is built on him, we won't budge. So I just ask you to ask yourself, do I believe it? And am I living like it? Because he is faithful. He is good. He is trustworthy. It's not him that's the problem. Sometimes it's us. I just encourage us this morning to rest in the fact that he will not fail you. And if you doubt that today, ask the Lord to give you more faith. Because he will. Pray with me. Father, we are so thankful. Sovereign creator, giver of our breath, sustainer of every moment of our life, you are faithful. You numbered the hairs on our head. You have counted every step that we would take. You knew from before the beginning of the world that we would sin and that we would need a savior And you chose to send your son, even though it was us who messed it up in the first place. Almighty Father, Almighty God, our brother and our friend, fill our hearts with hope today. Hope is not dependent upon our circumstances. Hope is dependent upon the subject of our belief. If we're believing that our circumstances will get better, then we will find that our hope will waver. But if we believe that our hope is based upon who you say you are, then there is nothing that could take our hope away. There is nothing that could strip any of your promises away. There is nothing that could take us out of your hand because our hope is not dependent upon what life says about you. Our hope is dependent upon who you say you are and what you've done because of it. Oh, Father, would you give us faith? We are a people who are easily distracted. Lord, would you change our hearts this morning? Would you firm us up in our faith today? Because today is all we have. We don't need to worry about what we did yesterday. You've taken care of it. We don't need to worry about what we're going to do tomorrow. You're in control today is what you've given us, and you've asked us to be who you want us to be today. And so, Lord, we ask that you make us wholly dependent upon you, because that is the best place for us to be. It's the only place we need to be, right with our Savior, at your feet, screaming, you will not fail. Please make it so. In your name, amen.
let's stand together to continue work continue to worship our holy God sing oh come to the altar
may be seated. This time we have a special number by Shirley McGregor. Wow. <laughs> so the song sometimes seems like it's out of place being right after the holidays, but actually it's not. Um, so pastor, not sure exactly where you went, but this song is for people whose testimony right now is like pastors, for people who are struggling a bit right now. And maybe that's you, that you're discouraged, frustrated in work, struggling with what life has dealt you right now. Um, a lot of people struggle this time of year. Maybe that's not you. But what about the person next to you? Are they the one that's struggling? And they're the ones that need to hear the message of the song. Jesus loves you. Everybody needs to know that Jesus loves you. So the message of this song is my message to you. It comes from my own testimony of struggling like pastor has been over the and the reminder whatever else is going on Jesus loves you he cares about what you're going through and my favorite line in this whole song is your name is engraved on the palm of his hand that's a promise you can hold on to if you are his child your name's right there he has not forgotten you. He knows exactly what you're facing. He knows the answer for what you're facing. And he says, just remember, whatever else is going on, I love you. I've got it. That's this song. When you feel forgotten, when you feel you're all alone When you feel like giving up When you feel discouraged And everything's uncertain When you feel you're just not good enough When it's slipping through your hands and you've done all you can And there is still so much more to do It's easy to forget In times like this Jesus loves you Jesus loves you And he cares about everything you're going through remember your name is engraved right there on the palm of his hands and that's a promise you can hold on to it's easy to forget in times like this that Jesus loves you. When the funeral is over, the casseroles are gone, and you're about as broken as can be. When the sun ain't shining, and nights are just too long, and the weight of it all drives you to your knees I've been where you are When God just seemed so far And I needed to be reminded too It's easy to forget In times like this Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, and he cares about everything. 
everything you're going through. Your name is engraved on the palm of his hands, and that's a promise you can hold on to. It's easy to forget in times like this that your name is engraved on the palm of his hands and that's a promise you can hold on to it's easy to forget in times like this that Jesus loves you Yes, Jesus loves you. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Shirley. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are going to be continuing on in Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 40. Who in here has a queasy stomach? For example, Brooke, I know that about Brooke. Uh, for example, I can watch a, uh, like a toe fungus documentary while eating a can of mushrooms and it wouldn't bother me a bit. Would, anybody, would it bother anybody to do that? Okay, okay, all right, some of you. Oh, well, fantastic. So then you have no excuse as to why um, you won't get queasy this morning. We're going to be talking about healing. We're going to be talking about medicine. Because in this study of a woman who had a sickness and how she was healed, it threw me into a study of old forms of medicinal practices. Nowadays, humans can be stubborn about going to the doctors. I know that about myself. I know that about my wife. It would probably be far easier for me to paint an entire room black with white paint than convincing my wife she needs to go to the doctor. But I'm thankful that today we have many medical practices, medicines, homeopathic remedies, that have nothing to do with the medieval times practices of medicines. Amen. I can complain about Tylenol, I can complain about things, I can complain about needles, but back then they had a whole different variety of treatments for people. They have a treatment for headaches that I think we're all thankful that we don't have today. It's a little instrument with a wooden handle and a little screw, and then a little screw has a little, like a little buzz saw on the end of it, a little circular that they would literally bore into your skull and leave a hole open. There was no anesthesia for your bad headaches because that was supposed to be the cure. You're supposed to feel better about that. Mental illness back then was thought to be caused solely and simply by demon possession. So they get out that little screw thing again and they pop another hole in your head so the demon has room to escape. Glad we don't do that anymore. Also back then, we have a Greek physician named Galen of Pergamum. Okay? He was a student of Hippocrates. Anybody here knows about Hippocrates? The doctors today make a Hippocratic oath. Hippocrates was known as a father of medicine. Galen, a student theorized that draining a bit of a patient's blood would balance out a variety of human conditions. It's called bloodletting. Bloodletting would help many things like smallpox, fainting spells, gout, or, <laughs> or even poor attitudes in children. My kids don't like going for checkups just to get their updates and shots and whatnot, but it, um, tapping a vein and watching the blood come out. Also, K-9 
Cannibalism. That was a thing. Many kings and queens would have human blood as part of their diet. Brooke, you'll be okay. We'll make it through this. As part of their human diet. There's another cure also used for gout. I just keep on because I'm praying for you, so gout's been in my mind. The boiling of human bones would produce an oil that would help with gout and help with migraines. I am so thankful that we don't have that anymore. I am so thankful that there's a better treatment. My stomach got queasy looking at all this, all this stuff from the medieval times. And the thing that came into my head was, what was the matter with those people? How would they ever think that this would help? And then the Lord used that to help me understand that when I was walking my own life for so long and I thought I was a good enough person and I could do these things in order to have salvation and an eternal life, I did all this stuff for Tim and Tim's way. I look back at old Tim and I think, he's crazy. How did he ever think that that was going to get him a relationship with Jesus Christ and eternal security in heaven? Trusting in his works, trusting in his opinion, trusting in his ways. There's a better healing out there. Bloodletting. Cannibalism. Drinking bone broth of the human kind. Today we're going to be talking about three people. Three people who had nothing to help them with their sickness at that time. Or so they thought. These three people are as follows. A woman who has been plagued with a sickness of bleeding for 12 years. And we have a 12-year-old daughter that falls ill to the point of death. And the third person, is anyone here today that is still trusting in themselves for salvation? Two of these three have a direct encounter with Jesus Christ, and they leave relieved of their former status, and they live a new life. The outcome of the third may today be the day that you leave here relieved of your former self and live in the newness of Jesus Christ. Because the saying goes, let Jesus change your life. I've heard that a bunch of times. You trust in Jesus, it'll change your life. If you don't have Jesus, you're not truly alive. You trust in Jesus, it'll change your death. Because he is the life. He is the remedy of what ails you this morning. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for your Son. I thank you that we do not, at this day and age, have to take part in any of those old medicinal practices. I am thankful that we get to gather here this morning. May we be a thankful people that we belong to a family of the King, adopted as sons and heirs, lifting one another up in our prayers. Those of us that know the healing that comes through your Son, may we be a people that goes out and tells everyone about him. And on the hardest days of this life, may our focus be on your Son, knowing that everything is in your hands through him, through his status, through his status. Please give me the words to speak. Give us the ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so often it's been asked of me, uh, Pastor, do you get nervous before you preach? Yeah, yeah, I do. It's a thing. And I'm like, well, you preach, you preach so much. Why do you get nervous? Okay, who here likes roller coasters? You like roller coasters? I kind of like roller coasters. The one thing I hate about roller coasters is the... So while I'm back there and Pastor Matt's talking about me, I am closing my eyes and I'm praying and I'm going, I'd like the roller coasters that just <laughs> go. So here we are, tipped over the top of the peak, and we're going to go into the scriptures. I am thankful to be here. I'm thankful you're here. 
Let's see what the Lord has for us today. Now, when Jesus returned, fantastic. Since we go verse by verse through the scriptures, where did Jesus just return from? Those of us that were here this last time, he just returned from relieving the garrison demoniac. Relieving him of all the demons. Talking with the people who didn't want any part of him. And said, get out of here. And he got back in the boat and he came back across. Now when Jesus returned from the very people that he had just done miracles for and then come across, was not wanted over here, so he returns to his people, the crowd welcomed him. For they were all waiting for him. Are you waiting for the Lord and are you excited to welcome him when he returns? Because he's gone all about for a little while. He is coming back. And he should receive a welcome from his people rather than not this guy again. You welcome him this morning. Are you waiting for him in hope? They were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus who was a ruler of the synagogue head of the temple. He was one of the main dudes in the area. And falling at Jesus' feet. Take note, you will see a few times falling at Jesus' feet. He's got good position for a believer. At the feet of Christ. He knows where to go. He knows where to go when he has a need. At the feet of the one who can do anything about it. For you this day, if there's something going on in your life, best position for you is to fall before the feet of the throne of grace and pray. Seek him. He implored him. Implored. Beseeched. Begged him to come to his house. At the feet of Christ, he fell. That Greek word is that's an easier one to remember. Pipto, to fall. To descend from a higher place to a lower. This is Jairus. This is the ruler of the synagogue. The head honcho at the temple is now on his knees, on his face. Seems to me like he descended from a higher position to a lower. Humbling himself to lay himself down before the feet of the cross over the feet of Jesus Christ. He knew where to go. He begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. Where would you go if your child was dying? Skyler's 15, Camden's 13, Max is 10, floating around this 12. I do not know what I would do. I knew the first thing I would do, cry out with every bone in my body to my God to please help. The same thing he's doing. The urgency to go to Christ on behalf of somebody else. As Jesus went, he responded. He went. Jairus called out. Jesus answered. He went. On his way, the people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. The Gospel of Mark actually points out that she got worse by the old world treatments. No kidding. Because of what was already been talked about and studied, that what could they have done for her? I have an idea. This woman who has blood for 12 years, let's try bloodletting. No, that's the problem. How about boring holes into her head? No. There was such a lack of care for female anatomy back in old medicine. They used to think back then that the womb of a woman was free roaming and had a mind of its own. 
If a woman was not able to get pregnant, they would try to coax the womb back to where it's supposed to be by putting noxious fumes by the nose and sweet smelling aroma towards the ground in order to attract the womb to settle. They didn't know a whole lot about anatomy. There wasn't anybody to help her. The world could not give her what she needed. She must have heard that there is healing, that there is the one, that there's this Jesus, the one they call the Messiah. And this is where he's going to be. Not only could she not be healed by anyone, but according to Leviticus chapter 15, verses 25 through 33, this is what this woman had to face. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge shall be continued in uncleanliness. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies, all the days of her discharge, shall be to her as a bed of impurity. Everything on which she sits shall be unclean, as in the uncleanliness of her menstrual impurity. Whoever touches these things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. <sighs> Ostracized. That's like a leper. Unclean not able to go into the temple because she's unclean. Not able to be known by a man or husband because she is unclean. So lack of relationship, lack of ability to worship, lack of societal and cultural belonging. Alone. And she hears of the one that can heal her. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. Touched his fringe. Took a while and studied that. Fringe, the bottom of the robe, the tassels of a Jewish teacher's robe. Why would she touch the bottom? Because that's where she was. Back then, they didn't have what we have now in order to help with bleeding. It would be too graphic for you. But they would use claws to wrap their body and the women would lay on their sides. Couldn't sit on anything. Couldn't lay on anything. Couldn't be around anything. Otherwise, everything she touched, everything she knew, everything she was around was unclean. She was crawling to the Savior. That's where he is. I don't care what I look like doing this. People are probably saying, unclean, watch out for this one. I don't care what they say. I'm getting to him. Everything I touch becomes unclean. The second she touched a fringe of his garment, she was clean. Because Christ takes the very darkest parts of your uncleanliness and through him makes you clean. She was on her face behind the Savior. She has a good position before Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, uh, Master, the crowds uh, surround you and are pressing in on you. There's people everywhere. But Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. Proximity to Jesus Christ does not mean relationship. I can be in an elevator with my wife and another woman. I don't know her just because she's next to me. This one is my wife. If I were to hold both of their hands, I would feel a strike across the face of my wife. No, I would feel the difference. This, one, this is her. I've always told my kids, you blindfold me and you line up all the women in the universe. 
How many of you think it would take for me to hug one and figure out which one was my Beth? The first one, because Beth would scream from all the way down here, Are you kidding me? (laughs) I'm sorry. I know mine. Relationship. Christ knows his relationship. Proximity with Jesus Christ does not mean relationship. Someone touched me by faith. Who was it that touched me? I thought Jesus knew everything. Yes, he does. Much like the father asked in the garden, Oh, Adam, where are you? He knew. Just like a dad in my house will go, Oh, boys, where are I know where they are. It's their opportunity to speak. It's their opportunity to pronounce where they are and what has transpired. Someone has touched me. My power has gone from me and into somebody else. I think that is a wonderful, a beautiful truth. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you get him. You get his power, his spirit as a gift. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, who do you think you're hiding from this morning? Christ sees you. God sees you. He sees your struggle. He is not unfamiliar with your pain and your grief. And he knows the path that he's laid you on. He knows who you're running from. He knows what you're hiding. Trust him. And she then came back to him trembling. Trembling. At first she's crawling on her side through a crowd upon screams of unclean just to touch him, just to get close to him. And then when she becomes healed, she trembles at his call. She now understands because she's heard of this Messiah. And she's sought the answers from the world for 12 years. And she's gotten worse and worse and worse. And by faith, she reaches out and touches, and she is completely healed. She understands the power that she is dealing with. And now she trembles. It's not out of beaten dog fear. It's, this is the Son of God, and he just called me out. And what's her position again? Falling down before him. Declared in the presence of all the people, why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. How many people in your family know your testimony? How many people in your extended family know your testimony? How many people in this community? How many people that work at Meyer know your testimony? Declared in the presence of all the people that were just calling her unclean. why she touched him? The only thing that can help. Why she crawled to him? Because he's exactly who he says he is. How she had been immediately healed? This is the Son of God, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Go in peace. Well, how could she go in peace? Leviticus continues on in chapter 17. Again, referring to blood. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Because she had faith in the power of who he is, the power in his blood, he healed her unclean blood. 
with the purity of his. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And now Jairus over here, he just heard the word daughter. What do you think he's thinking about? Oh, I got, I know that he's the Messiah and everything, but we got stuff to do. Like, why are you, why, why did you stop and talk to her? I asked first. Do we get impatient with our Savior? Do we get impatient with our God? I cannot, if it was, who? If it was my goose, Cam Cam, or Maxi, and uh, hmm, somebody else cut in line, this human would be unsettled. I don't like waiting. I don't like... Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Where Christ is, there is peace. She was made clean by the life of Jesus Christ. That carries along her peace. While he was still speaking, he is still speaking to the crowd. Someone from the ruler's house came and said, Too late. Your daughter is dead. Don't, don't trouble the teacher anymore. What kind of announcement and pronouncement is that? At this moment, I'd like to talk about Peter and Judas. This one that came to the ruler and said, daughter's dead. It's done. No hope. Despair. Peter and Judas were both called disciples. Peter and Judas both betrayed the Christ. Peter's motivation was self-preservation. Denying the Christ three times. Judas' motivation, 30 pieces of silver. After they were convicted and grieved and guilt-ridden about what they had done, Peter turned to Christ, asked for forgiveness, and he is forgiven. Known as the rock. Judas, turned to despair, secluded himself, killed himself because he chose to identify with his despair and his trauma and his guilt and his shame rather than identify with the fact that Jesus Christ, I wholeheartedly believe if Judas would come fall before the Lord, 30 pieces of silver and all, say, Lord, forgive me for what I've done. Jesus Christ, I believe, would have saved him. Judas chose despair. This servant came and said, your daughter's dead. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. Teacher? He's more than a teacher. Ain't? You're not troubling him when you bring him your woes. He wants to hear from you. So do I. I get phone calls all the time. Sorry for bothering you, Pastor. What do you think I'm here for? I'm not bothered by y'all. I want to be able to help you. But the despair here, do not be so quick to build your relationship with your trauma over building a relationship with Christ. You know how I know that there is hope this morning for that third person that I've been talking about? Still breathing. You're still here. And I just realized it's 1150. Praise the Lord. We're continuing on. Okay. Speaking of 50, verse 50. God sovereign. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear. Do not let fear consume you. Do not identify and grow yourself in fear, anxiety of the unknown, you, oh, wonderful, little, finite-brained creation. Do not fear. Don't dwell on the negative. Don't dwell in despair. There's death there. Only believe. 
Only believe and she will be well. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 reads this. <laughs> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom, all insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his own will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it when we're with him to the praise of his glory. You believe him. I believe in him. Believe him. So have a proximity to Jesus Christ. Have a relationship with him. Do not fear. Believe and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James. Peter and James. Peter, the rock in which he's going to build his church. James is going to be the head of the Jewish temple. John is going to live out his days on Patmos. Peter and James were martyred. John, the author of the Gospel of John and who Christ came to on that prison island of Patmos for the revelation of what is to come. Peter, John, and James get in here, you need to see this. And also the father and the mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. Despair. Because every medicinal practice could not bring this girl back to life. No amount of bloodletting, no amount of skull boring, no amount of bone soup. She's dead. Oftentimes, we've got to stop thinking about what the world can do, thinking about bloodletting, and start letting the blood do what it's supposed to do. The blood of Jesus Christ. And he said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they responded, oh, excellent. No, they didn't. They laughed at him. Didn't believe it. Are you crazy? She's dead. There's no hope for her. There's no life in her. She's dead. They laughed at him. Right now, I'd say the world is hemorrhaging right now. And the world is bleeding out. Because they laugh at his very words. Don't fear, she's just sleeping. He didn't talk to them anymore. I said what I said. I said this is going to be okay. I said that she's going to live. I said that she's just sleeping. I said not to fear. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, right. Uh. He takes her by the hand. Takes her by the hand, and he called to her, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given her to eat. And the parents were amazed. No kidding. But he charged them to tell no one what happened. And here we are, thousands, thousands of years later, reading it. Because they could not be quiet about it. John, James, Peter could not be quiet about it. That's how Luke heard about it. And that's how Luke is telling Theophilus about it. Child, arise. He didn't change her life. 
he changed the status of her death. Once was dead, now made new. That child uh, may not have known who Jesus was while she was dead. Maybe the 12 years before that, not knowing who the Messiah was, even though Jairus was head of the synagogue, might have not have known. But when she opened her eyes for the first times, who was her eyes focused on? And I believe, who did she continue to talk about from that day? You guys are not going to believe this. I saw him. I heard him. He said, child, arise. I'm alive. I was dead. Lazarus's account of things, how they happened. I heard him. He said, come out. I was dead, and now I'm alive. You hear the same thing from Pastor Stover. 27 years of my life, I didn't hear him. Then I heard him. He said, repent. He said, I love you. My friends, Jesus Christ is not sitting there at the other end of eternity with his fist balled up into a ball saying, you either believe in me or you go to hell. He's saying, you're already in hell. I'm here to save you. Child, arise. We live in a world where Christians, we, we know what we've been saved from, who we've been saved from, and who we are alive in. We are told today to go out into the world and to talk about all these things. They're told then to, shh. What happened about, what did all the people do when Jesus said, keep this on the down low, don't, don't tell anybody. What they do? Okay, I'm going to totally disobey Jesus right now. You guys are not going to believe this. And what do we do? We have been given life eternal, and we're told, commanded by God, to go tell others. We disobey in a different way. Tell the world the same things that have been told to you through the word of his grace, that you can now go in peace resting in your eternity through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that you don't need to weep anymore. You don't need to despair. Because he has you like a child. And my little Maxie would reach up and he would grab a hold of my hand so tight walking through the parking lot because he got nervous with all the cars and he was just making sure he had a hold. He didn't have a hold of me. Thought he did. I had a hold of him. Should he try to wander? Should he try to think of his own idea? No, no, sir. I got you. Does Christ have you this morning? The three that were talked about this morning. First is the bleeding woman who knew who to go to, and she believed. The second was a 12-year-old daughter. May not have known that she needed Jesus, but she knows him now. So the third person to talk about is you. And who will you seek? What's your position before holy God? Will your death be changed today to life? Perhaps it already has, but you hear the words of Christ and you laugh with disbelief. That all my life he has been faithful. Ha! What about this time? He will give me the desires of my heart. Uh, I don't have this thing. <laughs> Problem's not with him. The problem is your position before him, giving him the trust that he deserves. Who will you set your eyes on during the hardest trials of your life? Will you give him the trust that he deserves? Let it be so, and may God receive the glory for it. This morning, as the men come forward, we are going to remember the blood. We are going to remember his sacrifice, who he is. There's, there's a lot of us, to be quite frank with you, that are crawling on our sides. He is right out there in front of you. You just need the hem of his garment to taste his power.
I know there's some of us out there that are despairing right now. That there's no hope in this. Maybe even that there's no hope in this person that I've been praying for for so long. They're dead. There's nothing. Christ is still exactly who he says he is. You may waver on your hope on some days, and I'm right there with you, brother and sister, but he does not waver. He invites all to the table to partake in him, to share in the bread, to share in the cup, to share in his sacrifice, share in the testimony of the Son and what he's done. On this morning, if you have anything unreconciled with you and God, make it right by praying to him, calling out to him. Get your heart right with God. Get your heart right with your brother and your sister. Get it right with him as we pray over this and we remember his sacrifice. This communion time does not make you a super Christian. Christ's death, burial, resurrection has already made you into the greatest thing that you could be right now at this moment that is saved for eternity. He can't love you any more than that. He's loved you at its peak. And he invites you to the table by grace that we partake in these things. We're going to pray for the cup and the juice. And when those are getting handed out, we're going to take a moment of reflection to give you time to make things right with him. Because just like that woman that touched his fringe, who was she hiding from? Christ knows your heart. He knows your mind. I ask it because I love you. Get it right with him today before you partake in this. God, I'm going to ask you to pray for these. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord. We, we come to remember the sacrifice that was made for our sins. We thank you for your love for us that's so great that while we were yet sinners, Lord, you died for us. Mm-hmm. We ask your blessing upon this the elements at this time, in Jesus' name.
you could continue playing. Let's take a moment to reflect. And if you got to get right with God, get right with him right now. Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. We had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us partake. This morning you saw the position of the woman who was healed. It was before the feet of Christ. You saw the position of Jairus before the feet of Christ. May you as well fall before the feet of Jesus Christ for your healing. Because the world has its remedies. Jesus Christ is the only remedy for your eternal security in heaven. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Trust in him more and more each day. That starts new for you today. Please Tell me about it. In fact, just tell me about anything. I'll be standing back there when we dismiss, and I just want to talk to you. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, I'm sorry. I am imperfect. I'm here not to point you to Tim. I'm here to point you to him. So forgive me for that. But as we close together in song, I hope today you know the healing power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that while we close in song, we're going to take up a donation for the Benevolent Fund and give as you are so led to give. Please stand with us. Sing together, I Stand Amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unto
took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransom in glory, his face I at last shall see, twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me if you have the savior's love this morning you have the remedy for the greatest thing that can ail you and we would be selfish to keep that remedy to ourselves wouldn't we so go out and share it to the world that needs it most. Grace and peace, you are dismissed. Not kicking you out. Take your time.